world of journalism is in a constant state of evolution in this digital era, and arts coverage is no exception. As classic resources compete for attention alongside tweeters, bloggers, and Facebookers. Hello, I'm Howard Sherman, Executive Director of the American Theatre Wing, and our guests today represent a range of those bringing reportage and opinion to an audience eager for information about the theatre. Joining us are Chris Caggiano, professor at the Boston Conservatory and author of the blog, Everything I Know, I Learned from Musicals. David Lohr, artist in residence at River Run Theatre Company in Indiana and founder of the website 2AM Theatre. Scott Heller, theatre and book editor of the New York Times. Jan Simpson, former arts editor of Time Magazine and adjunct faculty in cultural literacy at the CUNY Graduate School of Journalism, as well as the author of the blog Broadway and Me. That's and Terry Teachout, critic and columnist for the Wall Street Journal and author of both the biography Pops, the A Life of Louis Armstrong, and the blog About Last Night. Whew, welcome to you all. <laughs> Let me start with a very simple question. I think we all came of age in the era of old media, and we've all had to learn and adapt to all of the new media opportunities. Do you find that to be an opportunity or a challenge in what you're doing? And Scott, I'll start with you. Um, I, I mean, it's obviously both an opportunity and a challenge. Um, it's an opportunity in that it opens the, the variety of forms in which people can, can write and express themselves. We have a chance to um, to move much more quickly, to break news, to stay on on a subject and um, and update news over the course of the day through our blog, for example, which we wouldn't be have you know be able to do. I mean, at a daily newspaper, often the arts report is is has earlier deadlines than many other sections, and so we would have to kind of end our news day at. 5 p.m. typically, something like that. Now we can kind of update and keep people informed all the way through. And that, that's an opportunity, absolutely. It's also a challenge in that people are often on and ex expected to be kind of keeping an eye on what's going on beyond what would have been the end of a deadline period before. Well, I was going to ask, I mean, we talk about TV having become a 24-hour news cycle. Is the print media now on a 24-hour news cycle as well? I mean, definitely in some quarters it is. I mean, thankfully in theater, you know, 11 usually is as late as it's going to typically be. Because we all go to sleep. <laughs> Got it. That's right. But, but absolutely there is a way in which people periodically are expected to be on the news over, in, over the course of an evening if there's something breaking. And, and given what's happening on the West Coast, we need to keep that in mind as well. Hmm. Absolutely. Chris, opportunities, challenges? Well, I, for me, clearly an opportunity. Um, I started as a business journalist and have been, uh, I, well, full-time writing about business for about 15 years. And then in the last five years, uh, you know, make, making the transition into arts journalism. And um, the, my blog just started as kind of a whim because I was writing a business story on how small business people can benefit from starting blogs and building what they call thought leadership. And I was like, I got to do that, <laughs> so I did in 2006, and uh, um, and you know it was you know almost almost accidental, um, but it's just I I've I've been uh, uh, desperately devoted to theater, musical theater in particular, for about you know more than 30 years, and uh, this was an opportunity for me to sort of. Well, I, I, I joke that um, I, I was boring my friends too much with my emails about what they should and should not see that I decided rather than push, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull and I'm going to create the blog and they can come and read what they want and don't read it when they don't want it. Um, but it just snowballed. Jan, from arts editor of Time magazine to teaching journalism in this area, in this era, and blogging. How, how's that going? I think it's a total... Um excuse me, opportunity, uh, because it um, broadens the conversation about theater. And there has always been this conversation about whether theater is a dying invalid or whatever. Um, 
And this gives uh, people all over, not just the country, the world. It's sort of a, amazing when you start checking your stats and you find out people in Japan or somewhere in the mid, <laughs> Middle East or something um, are reading uh, your, 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 your post. And it allows, um, I think it's, it's helped to nurture um, and develop the audience uh, for theater. So I think it's a good thing. Um, I started blogging because I had been editing for so long um, that I think I'd forgotten how to write. And so it was, um, <laughs> it, was, uh, it was just fun to just have this little space where I could write about something that had been um, a lifelong love. Terry, you're writing in so many different platforms. You have, within the journal, you have reviews and you have your sightings column, but you are also writing opera, you're writing plays, you're writing biographies. Um, how do you balance between all of the different opportunities? Oh, the next deadline, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but some of those deadlines are self-imposed because you've chosen to blog, you've chosen to tweet. That's Nobody's right. telling you and to I've do those things. And I've been blogging for eight or nine years. Right. I mean, when I started blogging, there were maybe a dozen art blogs. So for me, blogging has been almost a pure opportunity because the medium was unformed when I started. And it does more things for you than I can, I can recount here. It puts you directly in touch with people. Uh, you, you, you lose the, the interference, as sometimes it is, although it never was when Jam was my editor, but the interference of editors. Um, <laughs> you get to write what you want, when you want. I mean, blogging is, is, is pure pleasure, except for the fact that you don't get any money for it. But for institutions, and particularly for newspapers, it's pure challenge, because newspapers peculiar institutions whose corporate cultures are extremely hard to change and resistant to change. Most newspapers have had enormous difficulty coming to grips with what to do with the new media. They're just not good at it. They're afraid of it. Um, they want it to go away. They want, they, they want their careers to end before the ceiling falls in. And you're really seeing a shakeout between institutions which, like the Times and like the Journal, have really made a concerted effort to come to grips with what the new media are and, and how you use them, and the ones who just don't get it at all, uh, and especially, and this is the thing to be most afraid of, who see it as an age struggle where you have these, these hordes of the young who are coming in to eat your job. Uh, if, if newspapers and magazines could really see uh, the new platforms is pure opportunity. They do better with them. I want to use the word magazine to talk about 2 a.m. theater, and it's not necessarily a phrase that you've used, David, but 2 a.m. theater, certainly some could say, is simply a place where there's a bunch of blogs about theater, but it is discussion of theater, primarily from the viewpoints of people inside theater, talking about how and why they do it with constantly updated content all by a bunch of different bloggers. That's clearly an opportunity, but why aggregate a bunch of people's blogs rather than simply put out your own opinion? Well, partly because of the way it began on Twitter as a conversation, right? We didn't set out to do a blog. We didn't set out, hey, let's, let's see if anyone else is listening. We were just talking amongst ourselves and uh, one of my collaborators, uh, he's a designer in Chicago named Nick Keenan, he said a really smart thing right off the bat. Sometimes I think 2 a.m. theater is not something we do, it's something that's happening to us. And it just, it just mushroomed that way. And as more people were interested in it and more people said, you know, I'd like to talk about this, could I, could I write about this? We said, well, okay, you know. Um, and, and part of it is that it, it aggregates the conversations, or not aggregates, but distills the conversations that might crop up during the week on Twitter. Um, but then we realized that we could also use it to spark conversation. So it's, I mean, it's grown organically, right? It wasn't me going, I want to blog, you know. It was, it was more a reaction of, oh, I wrote this thing and people are listening to this, you know. And, and then to think, okay, well, you know, I, I might work at a certain level in theater, and I might communicate with other theaters at my level,
but all of a sudden I'm talking with theaters at this level and this level and I'm talking with theaters in Australia and Vancouver and London and Argentina and that's kind of crazy, but hmm. there it is. Because that's really the astonishing thing about this medium is, is that it, you know, I cover regional theater. It, it, it creates a reality in which the word regional has no meaning. Mm. We are all one big region off Broadway as a region. Uh, we're grappling with the same kinds of problems and to be able to grapple with them in the same space, that's the best thing that could happen. Right. I mean, it, it's, it's kind of stunning to me when I think about it now. Two years ago, I knew my region. I knew my immediate area. And now I have an intimate knowledge of the theater season in Ottawa, Canada. <laughs> I don't need this knowledge. I'm not <laughs> arguing with it, but. Well, but it's an interesting question of what that has done to not necessarily a monolithic voice, but the idea of certain people as experts and then this democratization of voice because these platforms, everyone is essentially equal. Jan, certainly over the years, you know, Time Magazine was a place people would look for cultural coverage. Do we think that, that those publications, any weekly magazine, has the same stature now in the cultural conversation, or has it been replaced by an awful lot more voices? I think it's been a 50, 60 year evolution, to be quite honest. When I um, took over the section um, in the mid-90s, um, I went back and I looked at um, a whole lot of former, you know, back issues of time. And I realized I didn't have the job that those editors did. There was a time when newspapers and publications really sort of set the agenda. They educated their readers in a way that they said, this is what you should do. This is what you should know. This is how you should approach this. By the mid-90s, we were already in a conversation. Um, the readers didn't want me to say, this is good. They wanted me to introduce them to it, to start a discussion about it, to give them some information where they could then go and talk to other people they knew about it. They wanted to be part of it. And what the, um, the internet and, and all of social media has done is to just sort of, you know, put that on speed. I mean, everybody now can be part of that conversation. And it's, um, I think it's just the way we communicate um, just in general. I mean, even if take it out of theater or out of the arts, I mean, if you look at all the ferment that's going on in the Middle East, um, it's, not, it's not been some great ideologue saying, okay, this is how we're going to have a revolution. It's been people talking to one another and figuring it out. And I think that's happening in the arts too. Mm -hmm. People want to hear from artists. They want to hear from, from professional legitimate critics, but they also want to be part of that conversation. Another word whose meaning has changed is amateur. Mm -hmm. It's actually reverting to, to an early fundamental meaning. The real, lover. uh, uh, the real lovers are, who are the people who ought to be writing about all of this, and now they can. They can afford their own printing press. Everybody has an equal voice as a blogger, as a tweeter, as a, you know, as, as someone, as a commenter. But, but there is this sort of uh, uh, culling process that goes on with respect to the voices that stand out. Um, you, you, you know, just because you've got a blog doesn't mean people are paying attention to you. Right. You've got to get people to c continue to come back. Um, t tweet, uh, pe pe people on Twitter, you know, are notoriously fickle and they'll, you know, well, it's not unfriend, it's, you know, <laughs> what, they'll follow or unfollow you. Um, and you can sort of, I mean, there are barometers of, if not necessarily quality, the response that you're getting from your audience. Well, that, one of the interesting things is there are metrics. You know how many people have gone to a certain article. You don't know if they've, or blog. You don't know if they've read it all the way through, but they've at least gone to the page. In the issue of setting an agenda, certainly the Times, historically, set an arts agenda. Now we see the Times actively soliciting comment and conversation about both its coverage and people's opinions of the things mm -hmm. the time covers uh, the times cover so how does how does that play into your thinking are you in looking for stories assigning stories are you trying to do things which will spark conversation as opposed to be the definitive 
I mean, I think I think you're always trying to do things that will spark conversation. I mean, I mean, I you know, the Times, especially with theater, has a kind of a bit of a of a you know a, a singular status or has had a singular status. And I do think that even with the democratization of of comment on theater, you know, the, the what the Times put it puts out there still kind of. Um, guides a good bit of the conversation, at least as it, as it begins. Um, and that may change over time, but I still think that that's true for the moment. Um, what that has meant is that we have an incredibly active, interested, smart, passionate, diverse readership, not only in New York, but everywhere else. And, and they're quite opinionated. They know a lot about what's going on. They, they do want to express their own opinions. And so we've tried to make more of an effort to um, to bring them into the conversation and to have our own kind of expert voices talking to each other more to, so that, that it's not just kind of a single opinion handed down from the mount, but to recognize that, that, that arts criticism is a kind of beginning point for larger cultural debate. And I think we've been doing that slowly, but I think we're, we're getting better at it. Mm. What do you all look at? Do you look at other coverage now that it's ever easier to find? You don't have to go to a national newsstand and find a newspaper? What sure. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, and, and as, as we all know, there are sites that facilitate this. Uh, stage group. Yeah, um, Broadway stars. I mean, right. you, you can easily find out what everybody said uh, sitting at your desk in the morning. And I want to know that. I mean, it, it's not that it matters in some deep sense. I, I don't tremble because I disagreed with everybody, but I'm curious. I want to know what the what what the discourse is, wh where the conversation stands this morning, and now I can find that out in New York. I can also find it out in Chicago. I can find it out anywhere I want. That's wonderful. I mean, the, there are two. There are three great things that the web does. It makes this possible. It enables the amateur's voice, and, and I think this might, in the end, be the most important one. It makes practitioner criticism possible. Mm. That's, the, that's mm. the one where I'd like to see more development, but as far as I'm concerned, artists ought to be writing about what they do all the time. Well, you, you refer to it as practitioner criticism, and I'm, is it practitioner criticism, or is it simply practitioners talking about their work, certainly that's part of what, what goes on at, at 2 a.m. theater. Yeah, well, it's just a phrase. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's that uh, practitioners ought to explicate their work. Uh, they ought to justify it if they feel they need to. They ought to comment on what critics have to say about it. They ought to write criticism. Uh, because practitioner criticism itself, many of the very greatest critics in all of the arts have been distinguished practitioners of the art form themselves. Shaw. Uh, Shaw is, is is our great example. Yeah. Virgil Thompson and classical Clerman. music. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, Harold Clerman especially. Yeah. Maybe maybe more important than Shaw in a way. Uh, <coughs> and the web encourages people to do this. It privileges people who write well, and it always will. But assuming that that you can write in a reasonably stylish and intelligible way, it will allow you to get your point of view out there. And there's, I, I just think that's more important than anything that I, as a critic, could possibly have to say. And I think we're talking about a larger definition of criticism here. And uh, you know, there's this perception that when you're talking about criticism, you're saying, "Oh, I didn't like this. I didn't like this." But what what Shaw did, and what Clerman did, and and other uh, practitioners have done is put their work in a larger context. And I think that's the job, the opportunity of the critic, the practitioner, just anybody who wants to have a voice. They are going teachers. On. We are teachers. That is the most important thing we can do. And I, I'm construing that very broadly, too. Well, but since you say teachers, Chris, you teach. Is the voice in which you teach different than the voice in which you blog? Yes, um, but they're very, there's, there's, in the Venn diagram of my you know, two passions, there, there's a lot of intersection. And um, what I try to bring to my criticism is a historical perspective. I mean, because I do focus almost exclusively on, on musical theater, um, and I also teach musical theater, and I love <laughs> musical theater. So I've sort of made it my, my job to, I don't know, defend it and to, and to make it, uh, you know, because it's, it, it, in, in, my, in my many years of loving musical theater, people have dismissed, oh, you like show tunes. It's like, no, <laughs> I love musical theater and there's a big difference. And part of my mission is to demonstrate the, the, the artistic value of it. Um, and I think there's a lot of overlap there. But I try to bring, it's, it's, it's awkward because 
Um, Scott and I were talking before the cameras came on about um, Nick Adams, who's a Boston Conservatory student who's in Priscilla, which I saw last mm -hmm. night. Um, fortunately, I didn't have, well, for, or unfortunately, I didn't have, <laughs> Nick was slightly before my time, but I'm starting to get to the point where my students are in the shows I'm reviewing, and it becomes awkward. And, and what I say to my students while I have them is, while you're in the school, you are off limits. Once you graduate, no holds barred. I will, be, I will be respectful, but I will also be honest, and I think that's in everybody's best interest. But you talk to them differently in the class? I mean, your, your voice in the classroom is different than the, your think, voice on the screen? Um, I, don't, I don't know. I don't, I mean, I, I, I don't, I'm not aware of sort of changing it. I think I try to be, when, you know, like as we all do, when someone's right there, you might be a little bit more likely to soften things. Um, whereas, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, I'm sure all critics have had this experience. You're saying something and there's a snappy turn of phrase and then you regret it later because <laughs> it's just maybe just a little bit too, you know, acidic. Well, seduced by cleverness. That's it. Yeah. That's it. And, um, and I think that that's a wonderful p part of the overlap is that bec as more of my students uh, become, are in the, the, the profession, um, I sort of I put a face on the actor, and it reminds me that these are these are human beings. I have a right to criticize again with a larger connotation of criticism, um, but I they also have a right to 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 have what I say come in a respectful and constructive form. On two a.m. theater, people are not writing criticism, but it is practitioners mm -hmm. writing. Have you? given them any guidelines of what they should or shouldn't be thinking or writing about? Or is it really you've just opened the doors? We, we've taken a little bit of editorial oversight. I mean, not, not in saying, oh, don't do this, or oh, I don't agree with what you wrote here. But to see, again, see a conversation going on online and to say, oh, uh, you're talking about the problem of highlighting uh, female Latino playwrights. Would you like to write about that? Come, come to the blog and write about it. Or you know, whatever the topic might be. And to say, OK, you have a very strong point of view about it. This is a subject near and dear to your heart. Tell us why. And tell us, don't just say, oh, no one's, no one's paying any attention, blah, blah, blah. Tell us what you would do. Tell us how we can change that. What would make it easier? Um, so, so we sort of solicit posts that way. Um, and then that's developed into saying different series. Like I've, I've got uh, one artist in Washington, D.C. who's, it's, it's very interesting, he's a playwright by nature, and he's now working with a company doing devised work, which is everybody goes in the room and plays and see what happens. And so he's documenting this process. And he's struggling with and it. And he is, and he is. Because, you know, the, the way I described it, last year to someone was that, you know, well, it's devised work. You're just getting all the people in the room that I have in my head when I sit down to write the play. I'm cutting out your middleman. <laughs> so, you know, and that's, that's kind of his struggle is that he's, he's in the room going, no, 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 you, you wouldn't say that. That doesn't, ugh. So, so it's been interesting to sort of follow that or to have uh, someone who works in marketing describing, you know, here are things that I see working in regional theaters right now. And here are things that aren't working. And so doing them is sort of a, an ongoing series of posts. So I'd asked about how, whether you look at other people's writing, does that affect what you choose to write, given that you have so much more access Never. to these other opinions? Never. I mean, it's, it's interesting. I want to know it, but it, I mean, at the end of the day, I'm writing about what I want to write about. What I. But if you I, if you read a, somebody else's review in the other part another part of the country that enticed you, you might hope. Well, to okay, go that's see it. different. Yeah. That might get me to go so. see a company or go see a show or something like that. Uh, uh, you're coming at it from a different angle, and that's actually a very relevant angle. I mean, I, I some of the people watching the show may not know that I cover theater all over the United right. States, and that's something, by the way, that I couldn't do without the web. The web makes it, it, it cuts down all the waste motion of gathering information about what's happening at, at theater companies in Alaska, say. Uh, but I'm always looking to answer the question, 
ought I to go and see this company that I've never seen? And their website, of course, is the first voice that speaks to you. But beyond that, the, the theater critic in that city, if that city has a theater critic, or people write me email, and this happens, and say, have you heard of this company? Because I think you might really be interested in them. And I might go. There are conversations that I do enter. Um, if you know, somebody is talking about um, uh, Latina uh, playwrights on, on a site, it might get me thinking about, well, um, where are these particular kind of voices? And I might want to chime in um, to that part of the conversation. So it may um, stimulate me to write something or think something um, in that vein. Right. Mm -hmm. A lot of times, we, we, if I am affected by reading anyone else, it is to react to it yeah. Yeah. or yeah. to say, here's an idea, here's how I'd amplify that idea. Yeah. That's a really good idea, yeah. and here's what else we could do yeah. with it. Yeah. No matter what I write, I always try to, I, I, I just, I have no patience for news or press releases. It's like, <laughs> trust me, you'll get that elsewhere. I just, what, what can I bring that's uniquely me? to this, you know, again, my, my historian's perspective, mm -hmm. my own personal sort of aesthetic, and uh, if I can't add something, then I, I don't blog about it. We've got nothing else to sell, hmm. but, but our, our consciousness. Is journalism moving in the direction of having to be dialogue at all times? Not at all times, but, but I mean, simply because of the fact that people can get in touch with us directly now in a way that they couldn't 10 years ago. We're aware of what people are saying and thinking, and that's, I think that's entirely a good thing. How could that be a bad thing? Mm -hmm. I just don't see a downside to that. I mean, unless you become totally responsive, mm. uh, you know, and then you become like American Idol and you're determining what shows you're going to see based on, you know, emails sent to the, to the Terry, don't the give blog. them any ideas. <laughs> <laughs> Someone out there. Uh, yeah, yeah. But I mean, that blog. beyond that, you know, what is the downside of being able to hear from the people who read you? Mm -hmm. I think people look at it as a, a zero-sum game. It's either it's going to be um, all just, you know, from Mount Olympus opinion, or it's just going to be, you know, the rabble out there just throwing up um, any sort of opinion. And I, it, it's not all one thing or the other. Um, and that's why I said at the beginning, I think it, it broadens um, not just the conversation, but the kinds of conversations that, that one can have. I mean, I think it was interesting that certainly for um, the first three months, for example, of, of the Spider-Man previews, before the critics, the official critics, went in, there was a lot of conversation. Um, uh, 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 on the chat rooms, uh, some people blogging um, and uh, uh, about it. Then when the official critics came in, um, it prompted a change. It prompted a, a different kind of, uh, it prompted, I think, the changes that we've seen happen there. I think there's a room, there's room for everyone. I think that um, uh, the thing that the mainstream uh, established press can do, um, and I wish everyone would do more of in the mainstream media, is old-fashioned reporting. We got, we got a lot of opinion. We get a lot of opinion, not just from, from bloggers. We get a lot of opinion. Um, uh, I think somewhat of what you know, Dave is doing, where people are talking about the process, talking about what they're trying to do, um, Obviously, there's reporting um, from the Times, and actually, more, more reporting from the Journal, yeah. um, I'm seeing. But um, uh, so much of the, uh, uh, it seems to me that the journalism, theater journalism agenda has been driven by um, a Michael Riedel from the New York Post. Yeah. Um, and I think that's primarily because there isn't a large enough um, force of people out there just doing old-fashioned shoe leather reporting. And that is the weakness of the new media, is that what the thing that newspapers and, and magazines uniquely have been able to do is, so to speak, to subsidize shoe leather reporting. Mm -hmm. Because you really can't do that as an amateur, as an individual. Uh, you don't have the standing to get through the door, you don't have the time, you've got a day job. Uh, when it is your day job to report on the arts, 
you can do something that other people can't. And I mean, clearly we are in a transition phase to some new journalism structure that integrates all of these things. And in this transitional phase, reporting is getting short shrift. Mm. Uh, and I, that's just inevitable. I mean, this will change. Because reporting is expensive. Because reporting costs money. Well, reporting costs money, and there's also the question of the amount of space, the economics of traditional journalism. I, I'm is just it just you want to to, okay. I mean, not only does reporting cost money, but professional criticism as it's been structured up to this point costs money as well. I mean, I mean, if if it's going to stay a a credentialed field that someone can earn a living doing, someone has to pay for it. Right. And, and in this transition, we may be heading to a moment where, where it, it loses that status. Well, and be kind of it's worrisome for where people. it's really visible mm -hmm. where that's happening is out in the regions. Right. Um, because you have newspapers all over the United States that are cutting back their arts holes drastically, that are firing chief critics. Yeah. Uh, who, who, yes, who are themselves finding new solutions, you know, setting up blogs of their own. I mean, uh, there, I, I just ran across a, a, a site in, in South Florida called the South Florida Classical Review. It's about classical music. It was started by the former chief critic of a newspaper who was downsized, lost his job. And now it is the primary medium for classical music reviewing in South Florida. I mean, the other side of this coin, by the way, is that often regional fine arts criticism has been very provincial. Not always. Some of the most brilliant critics in this country have been in the regionals. But there have been newspapers that don't put enough emphasis on it, don't know how to find somebody good, or maybe they don't have enough activity in the area to, to sustain full-time employment for somebody good. Uh, very often in a regional city, the smartest commentary that you're going to get is not going to be from the newspaper. It's going to be from the bloggers. The issue of credentials is an interesting one. And Jan, since, since you're teaching at, at the CUNY Journalism School, I worry about kids who say they want to be journalists or arts journalists because the question is, what will that job be um, five, ten years from now? Is that part of what you grapple with in, in your work or something that the students are thinking about? I, people always ask me that question. Um, the numbers of uh, young people coming uh, to journalism schools, not just ours, ours has grown, but um, around the country has just risen tremendously. It's really, it's really interesting. And the number of students within our school who are interested in arts journalism is also on the rise. Mm. Um, what do you tell them? <laughs> uh, I focus more on the preparing them to do the work. Um, uh, so it's sort of like what we do at the conservatory. Yeah, we're, is, we're, you know, we're, you know, we're very, we're very uh, 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 rigorous about it. But it's sort of interesting because the numbers of people going to arts schools is also on the rise. Right. Mm -hmm. You have more people wanting to perform. You have more people wanting to uh, comment about and critique the performance. Now what we need to do is develop more people who want to read and pay for it. Um, <laughs> you know, we're sort of working our way around um, uh, uh, of the table. They seem, um, uh, they don't seem daunted at all. And, and I think the thing that's interesting about the students, at least, that we're turning out is that they are equipped to talk in, they're sort of medium neutral. Um, if, uh, you know, if they got a job uh, uh, working for, for, for Scott, they'd be delighted and thrilled, um, and they can do newspaper journalism, old-fashioned newspaper journalism. But they can also do all kinds of social media and blogging and podcasts, and um, they're interested in communicating and they don't care really what the medium is. They, they do care about being able to make a living, but they don't mm. care about the medium. And they're also thinking in just um, a very entrepreneurial way. I think we're, when we, we talk about being in transition um, in, in, the media, uh, in the media, they, we have a, a, 
uh, a department in entrepreneurial journalism at the school. And a lot of them come out thinking they are going to create their own um, ventures and they're going to find a way to uh, do the work that they want to do. That's the and, best thing I've heard all and, week. You know. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. Um, I, I, and I think, it, I think we say to them, you guys are going to be the people who solve this problem. And they believe it. Mm -hmm. They believe mm -hmm. it. So it's gonna, uh, it's a very similar great. dynamic at the conservatory is where um, uh, we're in the process of reviewing the whole program. And one of the things that's coming out of our discussions is entrepreneurship within the performance context mm -hmm. and how musicians, dancers, and musical theater performers, which are the three divisions of the conservatory, um, you know, have always needed to have uh, an entrepreneurial kind of bent to them to be successful. But now, I mean, we have, there was, there was a, a young woman, one of my first students who was in a, a, a web series uh, called The Batteries Down, and now she's touring the country and in the Heights, and other kids who have created their own dance companies, and a young woman uh, by the did, name of- Did one thing lead to the other in that case, do you think? Uh, uh, I'm, pr uh, yes, oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. She, she gained exposure as a result of that series, and, uh, and uh, it, but this next example, a, a wonderful student by the name of Carly uh, Sokolov, um, created a video that some of you might have seen where she sang Sen and the Clowns impersonating a number of different performers oh, and it yeah. went viral yeah, yeah. and she started getting all these calls and and I've been collecting those examples I didn't to, know that was one create, of your students. to create um, uh, just a, an entrepreneurship program at the conservatory so I think it's an interesting dynamic that both the commenters and the performers are sort of reaching this point where they're just like well we need to create our own opportunities and the, the new media help in that process. Let me tell you about something in another field that's entirely relevant. I was having a, I was at a gathering of book publishers. And you know, of course, the, the brick and mortar book sales are in convulsion and it looks like the end of the world. Um, but of course, what is really happening, people are still reading books, they're just acquiring them in a different way. Yeah. And what, what the publishers are saying is they're waiting for somebody to solve the problem of what is the new media equivalent of what you do when you go into a bookstore and browse. Yeah. And they say the person who solves this problem uh, is going to become a millionaire and win the Nobel Prize for <laughs> publishing. I mean, it, it's exactly the same in, in theater. There, change will happen. The underlying desires won't change. People will have the same needs. They will simply be satisfied through different platforms that work in different ways. And we have to find different ways of answering the same questions. What show do I want to see? Uh, it, it, I think often people go to shows and their feelings about them are inchoate afterwards. And one of the reasons why they read criticism is to try to put the experience in some sort of perspective. They're always going to want to do that, but they are not going to look to newspapers that are printed on paper in order to have these experiences. So we all have to find new ways, new platforms of fulfilling the fundamental needs. Very few of my students actually read um, a print paper. I don't. I don't remember the last time. I, well, I, the last time I did was actually this morning in the dressing room when somebody pulled out a copy of the Wall Street Journal. I don't read my own paper on paper. I showed you your newspaper. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> I didn't even know we'd had a redesign of my page, you know. Oh, <laughs> which, which, which is funny, but which is also relevant because yeah. it's not that yeah. I'm not reading the journal. And mm -hmm. it's that I'm relating to it through a different platform. And therefore, my experience of it is different. I don't think in terms of what page am I on. I don't think in terms of what else is on the page with me. Uh, it's a whole different thing. And we have to think about how people interact through the new platforms. They're different. And there's a big age gap here. And we all, especially those of us who, like me, are over 50, we must always be aware of the fact that the world we grew up in does not exist anymore. We always think in terms of what's above the fold, or what's on page yeah. three. Yeah. Right. And, and now it's, well, what's on the first screen? Right. Yeah. But even there, everybody's screen is different. Maybe you're reading it on an iPhone or an iPad, That's or maybe right. you're reading it on a giant monitor. Maybe you have the whole page. Maybe you have a little tiny, you know. And it's also what portal you came through. Right, right. right. Maybe, right. maybe you're reading it through Google Reader, and it's just a single format that doesn't yeah. have ads, and it doesn't have your formatting or your block quotes. It just has the text. I have a feeling that maybe most people now do not read most newspaper articles by going to the newspaper's website first. 
They're yeah. going through aggregators. They're going, exactly. you know, I mean, and RSS. And, and so the whole the whole experience is different. And if we and this, this, as I was saying earlier, newspapers are peculiarly conservative, change resistant uh, corporate cultures. Well, well that keeps getting said. So I want to ask Scott. <laughs> He's the voice of resistance. Well, <laughs> no, but I want to. Oh, so I somebody else understand. is the conservative. I mean, guy. on the one hand, you still have to put out copy for a print newspaper every day, but you also have It'll to do. put it out for the website, mm -hmm. for the, you know, there's blogs, there's, there's Twitter feeds. How much conversation is happening? I mean, I'm not asking you to reveal secrets, but, but how much do you spend time talking about how you do or don't need to migrate to utilization of these different platforms. No, I mean, we, this is changing uh, absolutely as we speak. I mean, I mean, it used to be, I mean, this is kind of administrative, but it, 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 it's telling. I mean, we used to meet in the morning to talk about what would be in the next day's paper. Now we meet also in the afternoon to talk about what we're aiming for the, for the website for that morning with the hope that we can get, still thinking homepage in that case, right. but thinking about what what of our material could go onto the web early and get homepage play, which astronomically is where the you know where where the big readers the big numbers are early on. We have web producers who are absolutely instantly sending our stuff out as soon as first of all we're publishing on the web before things appear in print now. Steadily. And in fact, right. I often see your stuff right. on Absolutely. Twitter before, before it's appeared it, on the web page. On the web, yeah. right, and right. I so, tweet my reviews before the journal does mm -hmm. because they usually go up on the site around three or four o'clock and I know this through my Google feed when I'm up. Right. I know it before I know it from the journal. And then I put it on my website, I tweet it directly and usually about an hour or two later the journal does its own tweet and then, you know, years later the next morning <laughs> right. the paper comes out. Right. Right. Same for us. I mean, I mean that, and 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 we're strategizing more about that. We're not. We're trying not for that to be just haphazard, but figure out the kind of material that is going to reach somebody at eight in the morning and compete or attract somebody who doesn't only want to read about international news, but also might want to know know about what what's but happening. But the other the thing is yeah. that on um, the time site, the variety of news that I can find about the theater has really expanded. Mm -hmm. I can see slideshows mm -hmm. that are giving me behind the scenes <laughs> right. at a show. I can see, um, you know, you working a, a, a sort of a video about how they're creating the costumes at a show. Oh, I can well, get interviews, thing. all of this. I can hear music. Absolutely, the, the infographic with Where's Bono Now? <laughs> you know, Spider-Man process. I, mean, I really appreciated that. It's good to know. It's, it's, We're happy. it's really great, great, all different kinds of things. No, I appreciate that. And that becomes a thing, that, that becomes the kind of thing that if you love a particular thing, as we all love theater, difficult for individual bloggers to do. Right. And it becomes mm -hmm. um, uh, sort of like, you know, sometimes you want to just have a little meal at your neighborhood cafe, and sometimes you want to go to a more full service restaurant. That is and the that added is value what, that keeps newspapers alive. Yeah, if they're all in, of if they're these they can do it. wonderful yeah. different kinds all, of What things. it also is, is an opportunity for your students, because we have, uh, I mean, we have a dedicated full-time web theater producer who produces just the kind of material you're talking about. And so I do think whether they're coming out of an entrepreneurial uh, program or just out of to mm -hmm. typical arts journalism, to be able to do that kind of other kind of multimedia producing is just a necessity. Scott, well, do you think, yeah. this is what I think, and I'd be curious to know how you feel about it, that the concept of today's paper is about to vanish? I think it's, it's um, it's evaporating. Yeah. I wouldn't say it's, I don't know if it's about to vanish yet, but it, we, we certainly think about it quite differently. Yeah, quite differently. I mean, when my, when my review that appears in today's paper actually goes up on the web at 3 p.m. the preceding day, the concept of what today is in it's journalism has, has lost its meaning. Right. That's absolutely true. When we talk about the value added, what we're talking about is multimedia. A lot of this conversation has been about writing so far. Mm -hmm. Your background is as a traditional print journalism. It is about the written word. You are now an editor who has to think not only about the written word, but about media. Are we moving in the direction of 
that even the written word isn't necessarily the vehicle. For all of you who blog, we don't, we're, right now, we're not, you're not reading your blogs to us. You're not, we're not watching you um, do that. Are we going to reach a point where we have to deliver what's written in video form and does what we used to think of as television and, and print merge because no. of how people want to consume? No, because reading something is in certain ways the most efficient way of consuming it. You're not time bound. It doesn't necessarily take you 30 minutes to experience the experience. There is always going to be a place for words on a screen but there is also going to be, there, there will be simultaneously other places for other kinds of experiences, the ones that, like a play itself, play out through time. Uh -huh. but, but there will always be a place for people reading because the experience of reading in which you control the time slot is not one that any other medium can provide. But by the same token, people don't necessarily know who Chris is or who David is. Would you guys consider making yourself more visible so people understand, to some degree, the person who it's coming from. Oh, absolutely. Uh, one of the things that's also been interesting about the, the 2 a.m. experience is just that, you know, at first, when, when we realized, oh, well, now we're editing, now we're a journal of some sort. Well, okay, what did, well, call David the editor. But now, <laughs> you know, then I'm just like, okay, sure. And, um, but the interesting thing is because most of the people who do this don't have any journalistic experience. I mean, it's not coming out of that tradition. I mean, I have a very, very, very little way, way back. And, and I quickly went, okay, this is not for me. But they're all creative people and you get creative people together and they're gonna start being creative. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden now it's, we're kind of shifting to artistic director because we're coming up with audio plays and a play that we're gonna write on Twitter with several mm. playwrights collaborating and interacting, you know, knowing the end point and knowing the characters, but then improvising to keep the interaction fresh like it would be on Twitter. You remember and how stiff all the early web magazines yeah. looked? Mm -hmm. It was oh, because yeah. they were being created by people who were, who were thinking, we're gonna transplant the print media experience onto the web, and it was pointless because you could already have that. And not every writer is a visual personality. Right. right? But now, I mean, now we have form. The first such form was the blog, which arise organically from the inherent properties of the medium. And we have things like what you are doing. Right. I mean, and that's, well, and that's, 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 how the, that's how the problems are going to be solved, by people who aren't locked into the way that it's always been done. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and the beauty of it is because by doing the creative work and then spreading that through this strange consortium of people around the world, which again, you know, it's like we, we do radio plays with, an actor in Austin, Texas, and an actor in Queensland, Australia, and an actor in Vancouver, and we edit it together. You know? But by doing that, we get to see their work. We don't just get to see, oh, this is a playwright talking about what playwrights do. Well, here's something they did. Yeah. yeah. I think there's also um, the, the tone of the, um, of the conversation, and it's also begun to sneak its way into the times. Um, on the blogs, I know about Terry's wife, Mrs. T, and I know about Chris's dog, and they know about my husband, and we, you know, because we talk in this conversational way. And now I see occasionally in reviews, um, either uh, Brantley or Isherwood will be talking about the person they were sitting with and what their friend thought. Um, so the people who are reading have more of a, 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 of a relationship. Um, you know, I've actually met people who will, um, I refer to my husband by initial um, in the blog, and people think that's what I call him. Mm -hmm. So when they see me, they come and they say, how's Kay? <laughs> yes, I never <laughs> go home and say hi, Mrs. T. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I always get, so how's the nine-year-old doing? Yeah, yeah, so, well, you know, so good. people become very involved uh, in your in your life, and um, um, I recently um, wrote uh, something about um, a friend who is an actor who died, and um, Chris commented. But I also got um, a, another lovely comment from this person I don't even know who um, knew this guy and sort of felt as though he could um, 
uh, you know, grieve with me. And I think people, people start forming those kinds of personal relationships. You, you mentioned my dog a few years <laughs> ago. My, um, he's a Cocker Spaniel, his name is Oliver. Yes. And um, he got really sick, dangerously sick. He was, a, you know, I thought mm. he was going to die. And I just stopped blogging and just focused on Oliver. And then I did a post about what had happened. And there was this outpouring of support and affection from my readers that was just, you know, it just, it, it, it feels like a community. And, exactly. And, you know, with respect to things like, you know, podcasts or vlogs or other things like that, I mean, those are branding opportunities. Those are, op you know, uh, um, to put a face on your words, to create a connection with the reader or viewer or listener, as it were. And, um, you know, it's, 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 it's a question of time and the fact that, again, we don't get paid for this. So it's how, mu how much of your resources you want to devote to that. But I think it's a you know, a wonderful, uh, uh, those are wonderful opportunities to sort of expand. This also reflects a larger transformation going on in the world of news coverage. Jay Rosen talks about how traditional news coverage is the news from nowhere, written by people who claim to have no point of view. And that it's essentially the web has, has made this news from nowhere concept obsolescent because we all know that everybody has a point of view. And increasingly we are willing to, and maybe even we desire to see it, put into the coverage so that we really know the point of view from which people are writing. Now, you might think that a critic is always putting his point of view out there, but in fact, uh, uh, traditional criticism, uh, you've been encouraged to suppress the I. And I, I must say, I think the experience is more transparent and more honest when it's clear that the critic is a person who has a life and who has a larger point of view and that this may help you understand what he or she thinks. Well, you understand the critic, but there's also the question of since the critic is more available to the practitioners and to the audience, has that created a fully more personalized experience and does it ultimately, is it changing the way arts coverage has to be considered? I think well, so. It, it was interesting just the other day on Twitter. I mean, we haven't even done this on the site. But a conversation popped up saying, what, what do you think about uh, becoming Facebook friends with a critic? You know, how does that affect their view of your work? And then and people were chiming in saying, well, I, I'm friends with them, but they recuse themselves. They send someone else to, to judge my work. Or some of them say, oh, I don't, I'm not going to be friends. I will not accept the friend request or whatever it is. Um, and I don't know. I mean, how... How does that affect you? You know what? Uh, the journal doesn't seem to care about this. They do care that I not write about people with whom I have friendly relations. I don't really have friends in the world of New York theater because, you know, it's, it, it would be very difficult for me to do that. But I don't think in principle that it's a bad thing. I think, in fact, I think the opposite. I think that, that the best critic is the one who is most fully integrated into the life of the theater community but who is completely transparent about this. Yes. As long as you are transparent and people know what you're dealing with. I mean, I, I, th I think the best critics are the ones who, as, as uh, Wilfred Sheed said in Max Jamison, the novel he wrote about a drama critic, they're the ones who, who understand the miracle of getting the curtain up hmm. because they've actually had to do it. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, then that, and when that happens, then your reviews are no longer councils of perfection. But they actually engage with the reality of what happens in the theater. So, I mean, I think eventually these notions about how a critic should or should not be detached from the world that he writes about will come to be perceived as old-fashioned and outmoded. I think the other thing it does is for the, um, you know, the average person, the average theater goer, or the average non-theater goer, a lot of people thinking, I'm not... I'm not as smart as that Terry teach out. I don't know if I can go see that play. But when you get a lot of voices talking about it, it, it says, well, you know, maybe I can. Maybe it is for me. Or you get, um, uh, I think the general consensus was that the Adams Family was not a critical favorite. But um, there are a lot of people. Tactfully put. <laughs> Thank you. There were a lot of people out there who um, were talking to one another, some in chat rooms, some on websites, uh, blogs, and um, people who were interested in that kind of entertainment could find out whether or not it was going to be done 
well for them. Do you mm -hmm. know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It just yeah. opens it up and it says... And those, are, those are questions that can be better answered by people perhaps other than the ones at this table. Yeah. You know? Well, but let me, let me, to finish, ask Scott, is success now for an article in the Times based solely on whether it's good journalism or do you literally look at the number of comments and or look at responses because it used to be you would only know responses mm -hmm. based on what you heard at a party or what a friend said and you were within a small sphere. Mm -hmm. Now you can judge it in a larger way. I mean, the, the honest truth is that you pay attention to it. I don't know that it guides your choices, but I, we have a weekly, a weekly web only, or it used to be web only, now, uh, co theater commentary piece that, that Ben and Charles are doing. And I definitely am interested as I've been following it to see which ones click with readers and which ones don't. When I've researched it, what you find out as much as anything is it's when it's actually posted in the, in the course of the, the day it runs. And so some of this has to do with, with issues that, have, um, that really don't have a bearing on how good the journalism is or what the topic is. And so it's a different version of above the fold. In a way. Yeah. Well, there, there's also the, the famous piece of conventional wisdom. People are much more likely to write you a letter if they don't like what that's you wrote. A, that's right. exactly right. Too. Interesting. Mm -hmm. And we, the, we figured out that, you know, 10.30 in the morning, mm -hmm. that's when you want to do a post. 1.30 in the afternoon. Right. We would put, maybe tweet something that came out at 9.55 at night. Nobody read Nobody. it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know. Well, this we're all finding our way. Yeah, no, well, that's yeah. absolutely correct. I think we are all finding our way. This is fascinating. I think things are moving fast enough that probably two years from now this conversation will be outmoded. But for the moment, you mean twenty minutes from now. <laughs> <laughs> for the moment, it's... you're going to summarize it in a tweet, though. <laughs> if I can put this in 140 characters, nice that that would be pretty that. brilliant. <laughs> Um, but I need to say thank you uh, for being with us today. This has been absolutely fascinating. And thank you for joining us. These programs are brought to you from the Graduate Center of the City University of New York in partnership with our friends at CUNY TV. On behalf of the American Theatre Wing, I'm Howard Sherman, and thanks for joining us for another edition of Working in the Theatre. I'm Ted Chapin, Chairman of the American Theatre Wing. The Wing has played a vital role in New York's theatrical life for more than 60 years. Best known for creating the Tony Awards, we stand for excellence, but we also support education in the theater, and our work reaches beyond Broadway in New York. The Working in the Theater television programs, which are supported by the Annenberg Foundation and the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, are unequaled forums for discussions with today's most creative artists. Downstage Center's in-depth radio interviews were created in conjunction with XM Satellite Radio and can be heard on our website. For people who are starting their careers, we have a two-week boot camp for aspiring actors from colleges across the country called Springboard NYC. And our theater intern group provides a forum for young people who are starting their careers to build a professional network. All of the American Theater Wing's educational and media programs are available for free on demand from our website. AmericanTheaterWing.org. Thanks for your interest in the wing, and thanks for watching.